section, what we're going to do is we're going to specifically take a look at the remainder theorem and how the factor theorem is related to the remainder theorem. And you actually already have talked about this, and we've already made, made, uh, made arguments as to what happens when the remainder is zero, and we're going to see that again today. Okay, that concept, but we're going to simplify it and use synthetic to make it a little bit easier on us. Let's first start with this first example. Start and do part A on your own, please. Do part A, go ahead, you can do this very easily. Figure out what f of 3 is, please, using direct substitution. At this point in your math career, you have to be able to do part A. What do you get for part A? What do you got? 92. 92, agree, disagree? Others check, others check. Looks like 3 cubes is going to give you 27, right? Now times 3 is going to be 81 to start, so you start with 81 here. It's going to be 81 minus, it's going to be 3 squared is 9. It's going to be an 18 minus 12. I don't think it's going to be 92 just based on looking at this, James. Be careful. That's what I get when I did it. The red numbers on top. Morgan, what did you get? 56. I think that's more reasonable. James, check it out. See what I'm saying? I think it's a negative sign probably issue. Did you make this negative and then square the answer afterwards? Is that what you did? It's possible because if you got a number greater than 81 or 82, it means that one of these middle terms had to be positive. So just check your work. Uh, 56. So what if we go ahead and do part B now? Determine the remainder if f of x is divided by x minus 3. What's the setup again for this? What does the setup look like for part B? For part B, what would the setup be? Now, you can divide it synthetically or long division. I'm going to do it synthetically, personally, because it's dividing by x minus 3. That's very easy to divide by x minus 3. Jeff, what goes on the outside of the synthetic table? 3. And take a look. What did we do a moment ago? Didn't we plug 3 into the function? Right here, we took a 3 and plugged it in here, here, and here. Now we're kind of taking a 3 and plugging it into the function in a sense also because we're dividing by x minus 3. Let's put our coefficients along the top. I'm going to start by bringing down the 3 first. 3 by 3 is 9. 9 minus 2 is going to give me 7. Three by seven is going to give me twenty-one. Twenty-one minus four is going to give me seventeen. Three times seventeen gives me fifty-one. Fifty-one and five gives me fifty-six. It's not an accident. What do you notice? Obviously, right away. What conjecture can you make? Make it properly. Or just make an obvious statement. You can make an obvious statement, obviously, here, right? Make a conjecture. What statement do you make based on this? What are you able to now say after completing part A and B? Come on, use English and math at the same time, people. Bro, go ahead. What's the conjecture? Make a full statement. It could be an if that statement. It could be a when statement. When you do this, what happens? When you find C. Oh, 
All right, so Will made a, made a statement that says the remainder is the same as when you just plug C into the equation. Absolutely right. That's a good way to say it. Very good. Now, mathematically, what would you say? How would you write that mathematically with symbols? How might you write that? Uh, like if you were writing your own notes, what would you write? Yeah, so you'd want to say like the remainder of this. So maybe you'd write something like that in your own notes. Okay, but it's the same exact thing as plugging in C. And that's what Will said. When you plug in C and run it through, it's the same thing as when you're divided by X minus C and getting the remainder from that. So what do we call this first part, part A? What was the term for it? When you plug something into a function, what is that called? It's in the actual instructions in this problem. Substitution. Yeah, specifically what kind of substitution? Direct substitution, right? Part A is called direct substitution. What might you call part B now? We called it yesterday synthetic division. Would it be indirect? Like indirect, good. That's another way you could call it indirect substitution. But just to continue with the name synthetic division, we'll call it synthetic substitution. And this term here, we're going to call this synthetic substitution, this process that we're going to undergo. So again, f of c, okay, this can be evaluated two ways, with direct or synthetic substitution. A okay, direct, direct is one way, or synthetic is the other way. Now, What's interesting is actually this. And this is something that you don't see the power of until we get to maybe another lesson or two from now. So we're not going to really see this on this test, but I want to give you a little preview of what you're going to see. You might be asking yourself right now, all right, this is, this is great, it works, right? But why bother? Why not just use direct substitution? That might be something you're thinking, because I'd be thinking that if I were a student, I'd say, it's great, Mr. Howell, uh, you know what? 56 came out to be the remainder. Wonderful but I could probably do it faster with direct substitution. A, eventually, when it gets to be larger polynomials and the coefficients are greater, it's going to be easier with synthetic substitution. The math is a lot easier than using direct, you know, if the cube stuff. B, believe it or not, these values, the ones I'm pointing to right now, these values have a lot of impact on the actual outcome of the function. The fact that these are all positives means something about the roots, believe it or not. If these signs were alternating, it would mean something else. So these numbers, you don't get these numbers if you do direct substitution. Go back up. Go to direct substitution. Here's your numbers. 81, negative 18, negative 12, 5. These have no impact on the nature of the function. Believe it or not, though, the signs of these, positives or negatives, tells you a lot about the function. So we're going to see later on in section 8, 7, and in the extra section that I kind of added to this chapter, how much of an impact the signs of these numbers have on the actual function itself. So for now, just bear with me the fact that we're going to use synthetic substitution of practice, but it's going to have a lot of application in another section or two. Okay, so for now, again, this might be easier for you to do it this way with direct. For today, though, we're going to practice using synthetic. All right? Now, the remainder theorem is kind of what we stated on the previous slide. That idea that when you directly substitute, it's the same thing as divided by x minus c. If you directly substitute c into the function f of x. Well here, this is called a corollary to that. This idea here is saying, we're going to take this factor theorem, and we're going to get it from the remainder theorem. And read what it says for a second. And somebody try to explain why they think this makes sense and how it's related to the remainder theorem. How is this related to the remainder theorem?
I'm going to give you an example polynomial that shows this in case you're having trouble. So if I took f of x and divided it by x plus 6, okay, so x plus 6 would take the place of x minus c, and this is your f of x in black right here. Use those to help you think about what would happen. What would happen if I divided x squared plus 7x plus 6 by x plus 6? What would happen? What would the answer be? And you don't have to do it, really. You can do it with synthetic division right now. You can do it with long division right now. But what would the answer be if I divided f of x by x plus 6? x plus 1. And what would the remainder be, Jeff? The remainder would be 0. There'd be no remainder. Well, we know that we stated this the other day, right? If the remainder is 0, it means that this is one of the factors. If I literally did this right now, 1, 7, 6, I take negative 6, put it out in front, bring down the 1, negative 6 and 7 is going to give me 1, negative 6 and 6 is going to give me 0. This gives me x plus 1 as an answer. Well, there's the factors right there. x plus 6, x plus 1 are both factors because the remainder is 0. But isn't the remainder actually the answer that you get using synthetic substitution? So look at the function. It says it's a, that this is a factor if and only if c is a root of this function. What does that mean, c is a root of this function? I'm underlining what I'm talking about, or this equation in this case. It's a zero of the function or a root of the equation. What does that mean? Nobody knows what that means? If c is a root of an equation, or if c is the zero of the function, what does that mean? Jeff? Yeah, it simply means this. It means that when you do this, f of c, you're going to plug it in, you're going to get zero. Well, if I took f of, ne oops, f of negative 6 and plugged it into this function, I would see that I get, okay, negative 6 squared plus 7 times negative 6 plus 6. Well, this is going to give me 36, right, positive 36. Negative 42 is going to be negative 6 plus 6. Well, that's going to give me zero, that's going to end up equaling zero. So the idea is this, and you know this already from earlier in the year. When you get a factor, you're also kind of getting the root of the equation, right? Remember when you can factor something, doesn't that give you the x-intercepts? If I can factor a function f of x into x plus 1, x plus 6, from section 7, 6 and 7, 7, we know that with quadratics, if I can factor x plus 1, x plus 6, what are the roots? Negative 1 and negative 6. Those roots are really the x-intercepts. So this factor theorem and this idea of synthetic substitution helps us a real ton. It helps us because this, whenever you get a row with a zero at the end, you know that this must be a root. Again, whenever you get a row as an answer with a zero at the end or zero as a remainder, it means that this is a root. Okay, this is a root. So let's take a look at this next example. So in example two, I'm telling you that x plus four is a factor of that. It is one of the factors. So if you plug in negative four, what should you get as a remainder? If I plug negative four into this, what should I get as a remainder? Well, that I should get zero. Because if x plus four is a factor, then negative four is a root or a zero of that function. Again, if x plus four is a factor of that, then right away zero by negative four is a zero of the function. So let's jot that down. This indirectly means that x equals negative 4 is a zero of the function. So let's go ahead and plug negative 4 into this. And let's do it synthetically so that we can get another polynomial as a result. The other polynomial that we get will be the other factor. I want to get the other factors of this. That's the goal. It says find the other factors. Find the other factors. So if I use synthetic substitution, I can get the other factor. If I use direct substitution, it doesn't do anything for me. It just gives me zero as an answer. Again, direct substitution would just give me zero as an answer. I'm going to use synthetic. I'm going to plug in the coefficients up top. 1, negative 5, 
negative 22, and 56. Where are they coming from? Right here. The coefficients of that polynomial. I'm going to run through this table. Anybody got the whole tape with this row done? We know it starts with a 1, obviously, because that comes down. Sarah? Uh, negative 9. Not negative 9. 14. 14 zero. 0. Just obviously confirming that it's a 0 here, right? That 0 means that negative 4 is a root, or we could say x intercept. All right, that's an x intercept. It's one of our x intercepts because it's zero. What's the other factor besides x, x plus four? Take a look at what's left here. What can I write from those three numbers? Bring them down. What do I write? What do I write? What do I write? Remember what I'm doing here. I'm dividing. Let me reiterate this because I think it's a little confusing. I'm dividing this polynomial by this. That's literally what I'm doing right now by plugging in negative 4, right? And if I, div if I divide 42 by 7, I get 6 with no remainder. So when I divide this cubic polynomial by this linear polynomial, I'm going to get a, a quadratic polynomial, something squared. That's this right here. So bring these down. What do I get, Em, when I bring them down? Yeah, take a look. There's my resulting polynomial. I know that x plus 4 is one of the factors. Well, this is the other factor right here. Convenient. Convenient. What can I now do now that it's quadratic? Now that this is a quadratic, what can I do with it? What does it become? What does it become? Sarah, go ahead. Does everybody see this? The resulting quadratic that really is the other factor can itself be factored. Well, how come I'm getting a total of three factors? I've got x plus 4 from the beginning, right, that I used. I've got x minus 7. I've got x minus 2. Three factors. Why? Because uh, the, the x minus 9x second is not the factor. Good, which gives you two more. But my question, Will, is this. Look, one factor, two factors. Now I go back up. This is the third factor, isn't it? Didn't I use this factor already? Why am I getting three factors, Will? Yes. Take a look, people. Take a look right here, please. Let's jot this down. You can get at most, not necessarily all three, because they could have been imaginary, and maybe you couldn't have factored that quadratic. But at most, you can get the amount of factors, or the amount of factors you can get is equal to the highest degree, at most. The amount of factors you can get in the polynomial is at most equal is at most equal to the degree of the polynomial. Okay? The amount of factors is at most equal to the degree of this polynomial, or of this function in this case. So again, our factors are those two, and then we also have this x plus 4 from earlier. That's the x plus 4 from much earlier. Again, this comes from right here, this piece. But with these three, what are the zeros, or what are the roots, or what are the x-intercepts, please? What are the x-intercepts? What else? 7 and 2. Hey, those are your x-intercepts right there. So this concept of synthetic division allows us to take a cubic and make it into a quadratic, which we can easily factor if we know one of the roots. Well, you know what? What if we don't know one of the factors? We can at least test numbers. We could try 1, try x equals 1, x equals 2, x equals 3. Until you get a 0 as a remainder, you can't take this quadratic and then try to factor. So you can try numbers if you're not given some sort of a prompt in the beginning of the problem. Okay, let's look at the next example. Same problem as the last one. Um, well, the last one said x plus 
plus 4 is a factor. And what did that give us, the x plus 4 is a factor? We, we deduced what from that? Yeah, now what is this saying? Uh, it just gives you the zero that it's equal to one. Exactly. This is the zero itself, or the root, or the x-intercept, if this were a function. It's an equation, but it's still the same thing. So what this really tells me is that actually, x minus one is probably one of the factors of this, right? x minus one is most likely a factor, because that gave me x equals one. It could also be this, don't forget, look. This also gives x equals one as a root, doesn't it? So you've got to be careful. You can't assume that this is the factor. In this problem, you can. Why can I assume that this is one of the factors and not this? In this problem. Well? Yeah. If this were one of the factors of this, this, had got, this has to be at least a 2. Unless the other one, actually, I, I shouldn't say that. The other one could have a 1 half here. But it still wouldn't work. This is going to be one of the factors, okay? When you see that there's a leading coefficient of a 1 here, they're all going to have leading coefficients of 1, to simplify. All right, so that's going to be one of the factors. Well, that's one of the factors. We know that, obviously, again, this is one of the zeros. So let's go ahead and find the other roots. What goes on the outside? What goes on the outside here? Alex, on the outside. One. One, and good. Notice, people, Alex did not fall into the category of the seats where you put negative 1 there. If the factor was given, it would have been given as x minus 1, which means that, as Alex said, positive 1 should go here. It's always whatever the opposite is of the factor, or what you're dividing by, really. We switch the sign of c there. Okay, but because we were given the root, when you're given the root, it's going to work. So let's plug in the coefficients of this polynomial up here. Morgan, tell me what we got. And if you didn't get a zero, Morgan, what would that tell you? Yeah, that well, or that one is not a root yeah. specifically. If you didn't get zero there, well, in this problem, you didn't get zero. You made a mistake because I told you that one is one of the roots, right? But had you done this and guessed randomly x equals one, let me try out a one, and you got something that wasn't a zero, it means that x equals one is not a root. But well, because you got a zero, it's a root. As soon as it's a root, you stop. Because originally you had a cubic function, so now you have a quadratic. Once you get to a quadratic, you stop. And you say, okay, you know what? I can simply pull down these numbers. What do I have to put? The first one becomes x what? Squared. squared. Okay, and then I'm missing a linear term right there. So I've got x squared minus 3x minus 18. Can that be factored? Can you factor it? What do you got? X minus 6, x plus 3. What was the original factor we had? X minus 1. This was the original that we had in the beginning. There's the third factor. Again, as Will mentioned, at most we can have 3 factors at most. Technically, you always have three factors, but three real factors. We have three real factors. Hey, what if this, this quadratic couldn't have been factored? How do you find the other roots? You use the what? Quadratic formula. And again, if you can't factor this, use the quadratic formula, which means your roots, if you can't factor this, there's a good chance your roots are going to be either, they both start with letter I. If you can't factor this, your roots are either going to be or irrational. irrational. Usually imaginary or irrational. Okay, one of those two things. This you should be able to do very easily. Simply yes or no.
Alex, read them across. What do you got? So your answer, Alex? Um, no. Why not? Because the remainder is not function. Is not equal to what? It's not equal to zero. There you go. Very good. Hey, no, because the remainder does not equal zero. Is that correct? 2015? Did I just get 2015 across? No? Yes? I'm saying yes and I'm saying no. What did others get that didn't get 2015? I think it's that, but either way the answer is no, but I think it's negative, because look, look at this, right? You're going to have negative 4 plus another negative 4 is negative 8. Be careful there. Okay, and then we're going to have positive 16 and 1 is going to give us 17. And then negative 34 and 7 is going to give us negative 27. But either way, the concept is still right. Just be careful, okay? And especially when you have the negatives, you think might cancel. That happens at times. And the last one for today, the last thing. Yeah, I was going to say two other theorems that I want to talk about. Uh, so these are things that we mentioned, okay? We mentioned this a moment ago, but just so we have it written down now in some sort of a, a statement. Every polynomial equation with a positive 3n has exactly n roots. Now, those roots can be real. They can be imaginary. If they're real, they can be rational or they can be irrational. So there are, many, there are many ways to categorize your roots, and we're going to see further how to categorize them without even actually knowing what the problem, what the answers are. The next part, read through some. Let me try to explain this part. It's not as easy as understanding. What can I draw from the second part? This is not the easy part. I mean, reading is pretty easy. But what information can I draw from the second statement? We're going to see this later on, but I just want to see who can think outside the box real quick. What can I draw from this? For example, let's say I had something like this, right? x to the fifth plus something. I don't care what the rest is. And let's say I'm determining the roots of this. And I tell you already. Okay, I already tell you this. I say that, you know what? X equals 1 is one of the roots for sure. So you plug in a 1, you run it through the synthetic, synthetic table, you get a 0 for the remainder, you prove it's true. We're going to see how we can keep doing this later. And then I'm going to show you another technique. You also get 2, and you get 7 as roots as well. So there's three of your roots, right? You have how many roots left? Two. They could be either both real or both imaginary. If they're real, they could be both rational or both irrational. Why? Again, your options of answers for the roots are both real and rational, both real and irrational, or both imaginary. Why am I making those three statements? Well, Does, doesn't that kind of cancel them out? What do you mean cancel them out? So, Um, my, my question is this, Will. Why am I not saying the following? Why can't I have one imaginary root and then one real root as my last two roots? Maybe that's a little more clear statement question I'm asking. Why can I not have one real and one imaginary from the last two roots? Alex? Because it means the um, plus and minus symbol. Yeah. When you have imaginary roots, they come in pairs, don't they? Plus or minus? That's what I'm getting at here. They come in pairs always. Same thing goes for irrational roots. Where does the irrational part come from? x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac. So when the discriminant is a number like 37, you're going to have 2 plus or minus root 37 over 5. Aren't those roots both going to be irrational now? Because they're both going to have a plus root 37, and the other one's going to have a minus radical 37. The quadratic formula gives us roots in pairs usually. Plus or minus an irrational root. Or plus or minus an imaginary root. So instead of having three real roots, what if I told you this? What if I only told you that one of the roots was real? What else could you tell me about the four remaining roots? 
Give me some possible scenarios. There's many answers to this, not just one. If that's one of the roots, so one real is guaranteed, I'm telling you that now. What possibilities can I have for the other four roots? What possibilities can I have for the other four roots? All four could be what? All four could be rational. Let's say four more real and rational. What else? What else? Say again? For real irrational. What else? All four could be imaginary. Why could all four be imaginary? Because again, they have to come in pairs. What are the other options we haven't discussed? Chandler? Uh, two real and one, like, like one set of imaginaries. Good. And we could specify the real as real or the real rational, real irrational. We can go further. But the concept is that they're going to come in pairs, these ideas. Okay, this will help you a little bit. We're going to get into this whole topic in a seven in that extra section. Okay, but I want you to see where we're headed so you know that we're not just doing this, you know, just to develop another skill, but more to actually solve polynomial functions. That's what we're doing here. So if we had something x to the fifth, we could actually solve this now. And I'm going to show you ways how to do this. All right, let's stop there for today.